I think poets who are driven into exile, um, who go into involuntary exile, as Neruda did for political reasons, um, feel a particular kind of weight that's pretty much inescapable. Even if they want to write about their own love pangs and their own feelings, as Neruda certainly did. When Neruda was in exile, he wrote a whole book called The Capson's Verses, which are love poems to Matilda, who would become his third wife. Um, but I think at the same time, Neruda in particular, and other poets in general, haven't been able to escape the fact that something traumatic is going on inside their country and they feel some kind of responsibility towards that as well. And I think that many poets um, have felt, might feel, would be enabled by being aware of what's going on inside of their country as well as what's going on inside of their own lives. But I think when you're driven into involuntary exile, it's an inescapable fact of your daily life which is a little different than, say, just traveling around or deciding to emigrate to another country, which has its own powers and its own traumas and going into exile is certainly something different um, when you move from one country to another or when you're forced to move. And I think there's a kind of particular kind of weight that Neruda certainly felt when you're wandering the globe um, because you're afraid to be in your own country. Every poet has some sense of place, but some poets write primarily of one particular place, their home. And I would say Neruda, he didn't only go into involuntary exile, he also chose to be a diplomat, he traveled the world, he lived in different places. He didn't, he didn't write as an adult where he grew up in Temuco. Um, he also wandered, but he had a very strong sense of himself as a Chilean poet and writing for Chilean readers and for the circumstances. He was driven by the circumstances of what's going on within Chile. And I would say that this is a model for a certain kind of engagement. I myself am very much a North American poet and I'm very well aware of what's going on in America and it certainly informs my own consciousness. Neruda has, it's hard to say, Neruda's been, I've been reading him since I'm a kid and at every stage of my writing life Neruda's been kind of with me as a presence and at different times different parts of Neruda's work have affected me. I would say in a large sense Neruda's sense of the poet um, as a descendant of the original priests in quest of social justice um, has been an important idea that for me the fact that the poet wants art and the poet wants justice and the poet wants both is important and that Neruda was very clear about this, very sure about this, um, that poetry um, doesn't just write out a personal feeling but it, it seeks some kind of social justice, the poet seeks justice. That's been an important idea for me in determining my idea of what poetry is. Uh, this poem takes place uh, I was when I was 16 years old, the summer I was 16, and I was working in a box factory in the warehouse, and I was very affected by reading for the first time Pablo Neruda's Canto General, which was really behind everything, my sense of what poetry could do and my sense of what the world was like. Um, so it's a working poem with Neruda behind it, I should say, Neruda inspiring it. Second Story Warehouse, Summer 1966. Come with me to the Second Story Warehouse where I filled orders for the factory downstairs and commanded the freight elevator and read high in the air on a floating carpet of boxes. I could touch the damp pipes in the ceiling and smell the rust. I could look over the Puerto Rican workers in the parking lot smoking and laughing and kidding around in Spanish during their break, especially Julia, who bit my lower lip until it bruised and bled and taught me to roll cigarettes in another language and called me her virgin boy from the suburbs. All summer I read Neruda's Canto General and took lessons from Juan, who trained me to accept orders with dignity Dignidad, 
and never take any shit from the foreman. He showed off the iron plate in his skull from a bar fight with a drunken supervisor while the phone blinked endlessly from shipping and handling and light glinted off the forklift. I felt like a piece of wavy fluted paper trapped between two sheets of liner board in the single wall, double-faced boxes we lifted and cursed, sweated and stacked on top of heavy wooden skids. I dreaded the large, unwieldy industrial A flutes and the 565 stock cartons that we carried in bundles through the dusty aisles while downstairs a line of blue collars fed slotting, gluing, and stitching machines. Juan taught me about mailers and multi-depths and praised the torrential rains of childhood, the oysters that hid in the bloody coral, their pearls shimmering in the twisted rock, green stones polished by furious storms, and coconut palms waving in the twilight. He praised the sun that floats over the island like a bell ringed with fire, or a sea rose, and the secret torch that forever burns inside us, a beacon no one can touch. Come with me to the second story warehouse where I learn the difference between RSC, FOL, die cuts, and five panel folders, and saw the iron shine inside a skull. Every day at precisely three in the afternoon, we delivered our orders to the loading dock. We may go down dusty and tired, Juan said, but we come back smelling like the sea. <laughs>